welcome. Uh, for those of you who just walked in, my name is Elisa Author, and I'm Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and Chief Curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. And I'm delighted to be here as moderator of this panel, on The Aesthetics of Femininity Through the Ages. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Elizabeth Fell, Director, American Decorative Arts, Virginal Nadler, to my left, um, the artist Max Colby, as well as Gabrielle McConey, who's an artist and the Director of Communications at r Co. We're going to begin uh, by each of us taking five minutes to discuss our relationship to this topic from the position of our various professional roles. And I'll begin, and my jumping off point is a recent exhibition I curated for the Museum of Arts and Design. Um, oops, let's see if I can get this slide before. Here we go. On the feminist artist Mary Shapiro and her legacy in art today. The exhibition was titled Surface Depth, the decorative after Mary Shapiro, and it juxtaposed Shapiro's collage-based work alongside pattern-heavy and craft-inspired work by artists such as Sanford Biggers, Ruth Root, Jeffrey Gibson, and among others. And I just have one additional slide. This is one of the pieces in the show by Judy Leisurewood, um, a Chicago-based artist, and a wall mural she did for the exhibition. So this was a, a, one of a number of projects that I pursued that looks at the issue of femininity through the lens of the decorative. I'm especially interested in the ways femininity is denigrated and marginalized within modernist art history and the contemporary art world under the cover of this term, which carries a number of negative associations, such as something that is superficial or shallow, apolitical, false, cosmetic, something that's too pretty. Um, in other words, it's all surface and no depth. And this constellation of associations is rhetorically and materially um, uh, connected to the feminine. So to go back to Shapiro, uh, feminist artists in the 1970s, such as Shapiro, recognized the way in which the decorative was applied as a term of exclusion, especially when it came to women artists. Uh, her collage-based works, which I'm showing you three of them here in this slide, she referred to them as femage, this combination of the words feminine and collage, was a reappropriation of the term um, decoration or decorative. And her femage works reclaimed materials, certain kinds of color palettes, and ways of working with cultural connections to women, the domestic sphere as a creative space, and techniques such as sewing, which we label craft. For her, this was a, a, an unapologetic embrace of what she referred to as feminine excess. And her goal really was to intervene in the art world where something that was perceived as connected to femininity or women's work um, it was defined as a bad object. And then the contemporary artists on the show, like Ledgerwood and others, embrace this term decorative as well. It's also, they're also continuing this reappropriation and these issues related to femininity but of course, even go beyond Shapiro's attention to um, its intersection with gender into race and sexuality. Uh, but that's a different lecture. So I'm going to pass the uh, baton on to Elizabeth, um, and we'll hear about her position in relation to this topic. Thank you. I'm going to start here. We'll start in Boulder to newer. Um, so I look at this topic a little bit differently. Um, I run Herschel and Other Galleries and Herschel and Other Modern, and we cover 18th century to the present. So we have a lot of work to look back at and a lot of work to look forward to. And I think oftentimes we have to look at the word feminine in, in several different contexts, because I firmly believe that you look at a work of art in the context in which it was made. Um, that doesn't mean we can't interpret it with a more contemporary lens to understand it in a different way. But I think you look back at a piece of furniture, this is a sewing table or a work table made in Boston, probably by Thomas Seymour around 1815. It is a woman's piece of furniture. This is a, a form of furniture that was extremely popular during the late 18th and early 19th century. They were made in Europe, they were made in England, they were made in York, Boston, Philadelphia, they were for women's work, and they were outfitted very differently, one to the next. This one has a sewing basket that pulls out where you can keep your sewing that you were working on. Um, sometimes the top drawer has a ratchet top desk where you can keep your pens and your ink, and sometimes um, there are all sorts of different things that you can 
can find inside these desk gaming uh, compartments for game pieces. Um, you moved this piece of furniture around the house with you. And for me, this is the ultimate gift that a woman could receive from her husband. You ordered it from a chic cabinet maker in your town, in your city, or perhaps you even ordered one or brought one home from Europe when you went traveling. And for me, it's empowering. You take this with you wherever you go. A woman's work was at home at this time. And again, we look at this through a historical lens that that was the way it was. And it's not that way anymore, of course, but that's the circumstance under which these were produced. And I think that the extraordinary variety in which they were produced with the most delicious materials, this is rosewood of the finest quality that was imported from the Caribbean, um, to Boston for Seymour to make this out of. It has gilded mounts and gorgeous uh, toe caps and casters and all sorts of delightful things, including bees. They were made in. They were made fancy. They were made simple, but it was a woman's piece. It was her own, her ownership of, over it. Um, so one way I think about the feminine in works of art is who is it intended for? Who's the audience? I also think about who was the maker, and very often in older works of art, historical material that we handle, we don't find a lot of material by women. But in our firm, we've always been interested in seeking out what is out there. And we always make sure that there is work by female artists in our historical presentation at this fair. So that's just a taste of, of the way I think of things. I try to take it a step at a time and look at the context in which an object was made, and then I reinterpret it with my own sensibility of a 21st century woman. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yes, you know what, I actually I didn't show you the second slide, but I would like to come back to it later when we speak about the you go. Thank you. I'm Max Colby, I'm a visual artist. Um, these are a couple of images with, which represent some sculptures I made uh, from a very large series. Um, it's comprised of about 100 sculptures um, that I've made over the last couple of years. <clears throat> and so, you know, I kind of work primarily in needlework and textiles, so my work inherently absorbs a lot of history from those materials, which are oftentimes gender. So there's a very gendered history with needlework specifically and its labor. So we have all these kinds of notions of the domestic, um, you know, as, as a feminine trait. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, a lot of what I'm interested in exploring in my work is not only to dissect the, the histories of the materials that I do use, but to reevaluate our understanding of the very conception of gender through these historical lenses. Uh, so, as you can see, I kind of work with fabrics, needlework, and the formal qualities of the sculptures themselves are very reminiscent of altarpieces. They're very precious in their kind of object quality. So, there's a very art historical conversation that's going on there. There also is a conversion with the phallus. So, there's a kind of conversation relative to power structures, patriarchy, um, and you know the relationship of how those things all kind of work together. Um, you know, the kind of notion of femininity for me is such a complex one, right? My relationship to the feminine. So it, it's so kind of complicated, we could have a whole keynote kind of discussion on it. But, you know, I'm interested in how, you know, work can really reframe our understanding and really open those things up from a kind of non-binary perspective. Um, you know, one which doesn't essentialize a feminine or essentialize a masculine, um, but rather questions the very notion and the historical construction of a binary gender system. Um, and then I'll pass it off to you. Um, so, feminine aesthetics is very important to the work that I do, both as a gallerist working at Art Company, which is one of the leading design galleries that specializes in 
contemporary and historical art and specializes in designers that are really pushing craft forward in our current landscape. Um, but it also relates a lot to the work that I do as an artist and a designer. Um, and I almost, you know, it's, it's challenging to define what feminine aesthetics are. I think that we can put certain techniques and methods and materials and, um, you know, certain aesthetics that we can stereotype as, as feminine. But in the end, I think it's really important that we celebrate this. And that's something that I've really strived to do in the work that I've made. So this piece over here um, is titled uh, La Regina, which means queen in Italian. And it's very, um, very much based on my personal identity as a Sicilian woman. Um, it's part of a series that I've titled Ida, which in Sicilian dialect means her. That's a word that I grew up very much hearing over and over again in Sicily, Ida. Um, and so for this piece, I've really looked at the traditions in Sicily. I've looked at the craft, the architecture, the Baroque styles that exist, the ceramics, um, and really taking all those decorative elements and thought about it in terms of painting and how that can exist in a contemporary context. Um, this piece is made on silk. It was an active decision that I made to make it on a fabric material, something that's soft and malleable, something that we think about a lot when we associate, um, we associate it to women, and also the fact that it can be something that's either worn or it can be a work of art. And this photograph, um, I then uh, photographed at the uh, Villa Romana, which is um, this amazing uh, mosaic um, villa that's in Sicily. It's actually um, from the fourth century AD, and it's photographed on top of um, a basin for, for washing clothing. So it really has that dialogue that goes back to, to tradition. So for me, that's super important, this idea of narrative, of storytelling, of passing down traditions, um, and I think that's really a celebration in the feminine. Okay, thank you. So I have a few questions for the panelists, and I think they might have questions for each other, and then we're gonna open up to um, Q&A. And Imogen, if you could give us the time mark for when we should open it up to Q&A, that would be great, thanks. So Elizabeth, I wanna to return to you about this question, um, the way the term is used from a historical, or within a historical perspective. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that, the way it's been employed? Sure. Well, so when I, when I was invited to join into this conversation, I looked in the Oxford Dictionary to look up the dictionary out of the word feminine. Um, I wanted to see what a universal source had to say, as opposed to what I thought in, in the back of my head. And their definition is that feminine is having qualities or an appearance traditionally associated with women, especially delicacy and prettiness, which I loved. And, but I appreciated the fact that the word traditionally associated was in there, because that doesn't mean associated with, but it takes us back in history to traditionally associated. Um, my own definition of feminine is certainly different than every single one of you in this room in one way or another, but if we look back, I think there was a very traditional definition, and that, again, is the circumstance under which these older works of art were created. Um, I didn't provide a slide, but this makes me think about all of the academies on the East Coast, um, up in Massachusetts and Cape Cod, where young women were sent to school to learn how to do the best embroidery that they possibly could. And today we might think, oh, I mean, that is just so demeaning and so unfair, and this is what they were sent to school to do. But they were really talented and really good at it. And some of the most extraordinary embroideries that were completed in the neoclassical era, the early 19th century, are extraordinary strong works of art, and they made tremendous statements that have, have stayed with us. Some are memorials to loved ones who had passed on. Some were retelling of a, a biblical story. And so the notion of feminine as applied to how it was made and what the message was um, are often hand in hand, but sometimes not. Um, I invite you to come into the show and see several of these embroideries that we have hung alongside very um, masculine works of art um, as a complete dichotomy where they are, um, in the traditional definition of masculinity, strong and massive and um, it, 
it makes you think when you see them alongside each other in a small little booth about 10 by 20, um, as opposed to a home. So I think of, I think of the term in many different ways, um, to switch gears a little. I look at a lot of modern and contemporary art as well. Um, we'll talk about that shortly. But I apply a sort of different um, definition of feminine when I'm looking at older work and newer work, again, because of the context in which it's been created. And then I will apply my own contemporary sensibility and interpretation to it later on. I just think it's really the most responsible way to um, be an art historian and to be um, an art dealer even to research all of the furniture that I spent so much time researching to respect what was the intention of what was being created. It is not demeaning that a piece of furniture was intended just for a woman's use. That's not demeaning to me, or, or men, it's not meant to be. Um, and it wasn't understood that way. And we sell a lot of work to museums, both fine and decorative arts, and it's a pleasure to watch a work go from our hands to an institution, but often their interpretation is very different than the manner in which we've presented it. And I appreciate that so much because it's a well-rounded view of an object that was created under one circumstance and given a new circumstance in which to live. So Elizabeth, you bring up this issue of research, and I think it's a great question for Max and Gabriella too, like what kind of historical research are you doing, Max, when you're thinking about issues of femininity and the decorative? And the same for you, Gabrielle. Sure, I can start. Um, so, you know, mainly what I'm looking at are period examples of embroideries, needlework, beading, uh, weavings. Uh, I'm looking at a lot of objects that are clothing-related, domestic-related furniture, um, because I'm interested in really kind of dissecting points in which decorative arts and fine arts have placement in history of, you know, really gendering objects and gendering styles. So I'm typically looking, for instance, if I'm going to the Met, I'm very often going through all of their period rooms with great detail. Um, and so, you know, a, a, lot, and a lot of that research doesn't always translate into the work because the way that I work with materials is, is, is very different. I work with a wider range. Sometimes I'll use um, materials that are, are specifically based off of research. For instance, I'll use a Jacobian kind of woven fabric very intentionally, but I'll mix it with something very plastic and very contemporary. Um, so, you know, those are some considerations that I have with research. But then I'm also looking at the fine art market and I'm looking at trends and historical moments in which, um, you know, that conversation enters a kind of fine art context, right? So, you know, in the second wave of feminism in the 70s, with a lot of artists, I'm looking, you know, very specifically at how those conversations came about in institutions where craft, craft is looked at in a new way. And, you know, in the 70s, it was through second wave feminism. Of course, now um, we have another one of another resurgence of craft as is fine art instead of verses, which is typically how it's um, how it's presented to us, which reinforces male versus female power dynamics. Um, and so, I'm looking at a lot of those considerations with it as well. Well, I think from a gallery perspective, a contemporary gallery that works with both historical and contemporary design, we do a lot of research into the designers that we're representing. Um, in particular, something that I think is really interesting on our end as a gallery is that we're looking at also the overlooked designers that were, um, you know, famous not during their time but are now coming to um, the modern spotlight. So a great example of that female designer that we work with is Greta Magnuson Grossman. Um, there's a slide of her piece that I have here. Um, but she was a Swedish designer that migrated over to the United States, to California. Um, she was an architect, industrial designer, she was an artist, she was a mother, and she was had done and completed so many projects in the 40s and the 50s 
mostly in the Palm Spring era, but the reality was is that during the time, um, she wasn't appreciated in the same way that her male contemporaries were, and it's only now that she's really getting the spotlight that she deserves. And our company, we do a lot of research, we hold all of her archives, and as part of our mission to, to um, present all of that information now in a contemporary context. I think that's a running theme that we see now um, with more and more of these overlooked designers from the 50s and 60s and 70s that were really not realized um, during their time and now are being presented in a contemporary context. And just to Max's point, as you're talking about, craft is now becoming something that's more widely accepted and you can see that, I think, through numerous um, museum exhibitions on view, like the Whitney show that's currently on view, a fantastic show if you haven't seen it, um, but also just walking to any art gallery or design gallery and seeing that now craft is, is presented in that way. Um, so I think that we're on the right track towards everything, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in that sense. May I say something else? Something that I think is important to bring up in front of an audience Recently, we have noticed a push by many museums, a rewritten mission, a temporary mission, to help women and artists of color or different ethnicities catch up a little bit. And I'd be interested to hear both of your perspectives on the following as well. So the mission is now that they will acquire works of art only by women or by artists of color um, for a specific period of time. And this is a new trend that we're experiencing. I have mixed feelings about it. I think it's wonderful to give people a chance um, to catch up with, with artists that were formerly marginalized in some way. Um, I also, I have an issue with the fact that museums may then miss out on great acquisitions that do fit their more general mission. But I would just love to hear what you all think about that new trend towards helping catch up. Um, you know, I can speak really directly to this. We uh, recently at the gallery had an event specifically for museum curators actually to coincide with this show that's uh, taking place because so many curators from all of America come to uh, New York specifically for this, um, for this fair. And that is the feedback that we received, the exact same feedback that they're looking to acquire um, female artists and artists of color to diversify their programs right now. And in one sense, I agree with you. Um, I think it's it's amazing and overdue and something that definitely needs to happen right now. There's still stats that exist that um, are, are disturbing but real, which is you know 65% of, of BFA students are women, and then in reality, only 33% are represented by galleries. Like the museum is also responsible for changing some of that. But I do agree on the other side, which is that we want to make sure that it's open and that um, it's not just because of that issue. Yeah, I think, well, I know that the Baltimore Museum of Art is specifically one of them where their mission is for the calendar year of 2020 to only collect female artists. Um, and I think it's, in many ways, for institutions a real challenge because institutions, our modern idea of a museum is still a very colonial function. So it comes out of this very specific History, the French and the English are largely responsible for our modern understanding of the museum. And so, you know, their mission was to shape a canon and shape a narrative that really befitted them, um, that either placed value on their own culture um, or allowed them to pillage other cultures. So, you know, there's a, there's a somewhat kind of, the museum has a very problematic structure in and of itself that I think many institutions have been working very hard some time to really rectify that. We have a lot of discussions about returning pillage items, about acquisitions, about representation and visibility. Um, and you know, it's a very, it's a very challenging task that I obviously have very mixed feelings about. Um, because on, on on one hand, I think that it's it's you know really a great benefit to the communities and the artists that these institutions are choosing to on uh, instead of a more traditional one that you know they have a history of um, but then we, we run into some potential kind of problems as well and that you know maybe the museums are kind of
acquiring and presenting, you know, various groups in a very, um, you know, highlighting their otherness and essentially commodifying the trauma of those, you know, demographics. Um, in, you know, and I, I'm coming from a very kind of academic and theoretical, you know, position on this, so I'm certainly not saying that there's anything wrong. I think that, you know, if museums want to focus on collecting, you know, women, people of color, queer individuals, then that is a great benefit and only enriches the artistic communities. But we do have other things to consider in that relationship, and they should be things that are kind of addressed where an institution can be accountable as well. I should probably chime in a little bit on that question related to the Museum of Arts and Design, because historically, since the mid-50s, it's a museum that has supported artists working in traditional craft material. As a result, almost more than half of our collection, our permanent collection, is made by women um, because they are excluded, historically excluded, from the broader conventional art world. Um, a lot of times, uh, and, and so end up in um, sort of less so-called lesser mediums, fiber, ceramics, etc. So it's it's I, I'm fascinated by this move. Um, looking at other museums attempting to address this because one of the ways they can do that, and I think they're still slow to figure this out, is uh, to include more women artists and also artists of color, is that they also have to diversify the mediums that they're collecting. Right? They can't just always go to painting and sculpture. And that has implications for this panel for the aesthetics of femininity because a lot of that material is of course excluded from the canon for it being too everyday or too feminine or too domestic, etc. So it's complicated, but it's um, I it's fascinating to see this start to unravel and how this is going to affect the kinds of styles and mediums that come into museums now. Uh, okay, so I think Elizabeth, you want to talk a little bit more about market trends or maybe collector interest because you talk about institutions, but from collectors' point of view, um, do feminine more feminine styles or, or you know expressions that are considered more feminine um, ebb and flow, or is there trends that I don't really see a trend. I don't really see a trend. I think every collector that comes to see me is different. I'm, I often take on the role of psychologist. Um, you know, people will come to me together. My, my job is others' leisure time activities, so we spend a lot of time sort of addressing personal emotions and issues, and I don't really see a trend. I think every visitor, every client is different. Um, no, I, I really, I really don't, I, I'm not bothered by anything that, that it's all skewed at the moment one way or the other. Um, Max and Gabriella, do you have a comment on that? I sort of have an observation of the art world in general, but I have a quick observation, which I think is really interesting. Um, some of the female designers that the gallery represents can say are collected predominantly by women, and I think that's a really interesting trend. Well, I can certainly speak for my work um, in that I'm primarily collected by queer collectors. So, you know, I've had that experience where it kind of stays within, uh, you know, one space. Um, <clears throat> but I will say also that, um, you know, I think that this has been a trend uh, in the market for a while now, but it's sculptural work, and which, of course, will kind of lump in a lot of traditionally either decorative arts or craft-based work, um, is, is typically a little bit more difficult um, to sell in the market. Collectors often at least from my observation, are, are, uh, it's a little bit easier for them to respond to two-dimensional works, um, which are often paintings or photographs, um, and have you know different connotations. I think um, I've noticed it recently. <coughs> Excuse me. There's just a huge upswing in the contemporary art world, at least when it comes to scholarly work and exhibitions. A huge upswing of interest in what we think of as pattern decorative work. Um, P and D movement, uh, and related to that, craft work that is references craft or that brings it into the work in a new way. Um, so hybrid works like ceramic sculpture, um, where you have artists who work very comfortably across the art craft divide. So 
I've been in a number of exhibitions that I've seen, and it does, I feel like it does um, toggle between like the minimalist and the maximalist in the contemporary art world. It will go back and forth, and right now we're on the maximalist side. Um, questions for each other? some works by um, Katie Stout. And I was wondering if you had a position or an observation about how the handmade has been defined as feminine or not in her work or other contemporary designers right now. I mean, Katie Stout is um, a young female designer that we work with. It's a great image to show. That's from uh, 2018, um, a presentation at Design Miami. I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was essentially what she titled a girl army. It was a super powerful presentation of all of these um, girl limbs. Um, and it's interesting because they're almost to scale, but they're about five feet, so it's a little bit smaller than, than a person, but you can go up to them. And they all have different poses and different colors. They're all handmade in her studio using ceramics, tradi traditional material, and um, and they're all, um, they're actually all lamps as well. So there's this interesting conversation between something that's functional, but it's also a sculpture, but it's also a girl. She also titles them girl, not woman, um, to be more playful and to kind of um, take that idea of what we perceived as the female body as sexy and beautiful throughout history, the way it's been depicted in paintings and sculptures. And she's made it like really clumsy and kind of funny, um, but also you know very serious and very strong. These girls are pillars; they're holding um, lampshades. Um, so I think that the handmade quality is a super important part of Katie's work and her practice. She makes all of her pieces by hand, and I can see that as a growing theme right now in the art world as well. I mean, she's um, she's kind of one of those artists that's crossed the line between the design and the art world. She's um, included in art institutions, in art auctions. She's written about in art reviews as well, but in the end, these are lamps. There is a function, and she wants them to be design objects. Max, what about for you? Because there's a lot of labor that goes into the making of your objects. Oh, yes. Yeah, I... <laughs> all of the beading, and also back to the slime, maybe. So I do all my own hand beading and hand embroidery, and they take you know, dozens of hours just of embroidery for each work. Um, and that was something that, of course, I'm trained, I have a fine art background, but I'm trained in paper making and printmaking. So I'm essentially self-taught when it comes to all needlework. The reason for that is because the content of my work really navigated to a lot of topics that the history of needlework had just inherent in it, so I taught myself. And I, I always felt like it was important to kind of distinguish the way that I applied needlework rather than to appropriate, you know, essentially, you know, find some period of embroidery and integrate it into my work. I thought that it was, um, you know, it's important to have my own uh, application of the medium, my own application of the history and content that that medium with. Um, so it, it just turns out that what I, I end up doing is extremely time consuming. However, um, you know, it's an extraordinarily, you know, meditative medium for me as well. Uh, in terms of, you know, there's another function that that has for me which is really important because so much of the uh, gendered history around needlework specifically that I'm mining is, is around labor, right? It's, you know, there's so, there's so much needlework and so much textile work that is essentially free labor at home. Free, you know, so women's work is being, you know, essentially kind of, um, it has no value. There's much of that history in a lot of period needlework. Um, and so I kind of, I activate that element of the history as well by doing the needlework myself. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, do you have a quick yeah. If we could go to Elizabeth Church's sculpture. Um, 
what I really should have done was to ask you whether you think a man or a woman created this work of art, but um, I've given it away already, so I won't do that. Um, so we have shown the work of Elizabeth Turk, um, who's an incredible California-based sculptor, for 20 years now. And one of the incredible things about showing her work publicly at fairs from the Winter Show to Art Basel Miami to Masterpiece in London is that I would say seven, seven out of 10 times someone walks over and says, so what, what is his name? What is the artist's name? How does he do it? And there's this immediate light bulb that goes off in my head and say, oh, they think that men make marble sculptures because they're heavy and you need big, heavy tools. And it's something that um, really surprises them when I say no. Elizabeth Turk is the artist and she creates all of her work by hand with small, sort of dental type tools, files, water pressure. Um, it's a very time consuming, very personal, intimate process that she goes through to create the works, whether small or large. And it brings me back to the perception of woman's work and handiwork and sewing and the tradition that women were at home doing needlework and men were out there lifting heavy things and creating big sculptures. There were women in the neoclassical era, like Margaret Foley and Emma Stebbins, who were in Italy making sculpture with studios, but making sculpture. But, um, you know, it, it, it really blows my mind today that at every single fair or exhibition that I do, people assume that this is the work of a man. Now, they're very organic and sensual, and everybody wants to touch them because they're so alluring. And it's that aspect of them that have been called feminine. Um, but the actual making of them and the material has so traditionally been associated with a man's work that the element of surprise um, really still exists when I tell someone, no, no, this is an incredibly strong, talented, and creative person who, who has come up with these works, created them herself, with very little, if, if no help at all. So, um, where are we on, in terms of time? Are we okay? Five minutes. Um, okay, so we just have time for a couple more questions, and the other thing that comes to my mind a lot, especially when looking at, um, say, Katie Stout's work, or Max, your work, and maybe even Gabriella, your own work, like, how did the issues of, or like, the tone, um, there's a sense of humor sometimes I see in your work, sometimes there's a, a, a sort of kitsch appropriation, which I know you also appreciate, but then there's other works that I, I think you could even see as, um, very sincere, or maybe there's sincerity mixed with it, bordering on the sentimentality. I'm just wondering how that tone connects with these issues of femininity, or how you see that. Well, I use humor very actively in the work. It's something that's very important to me, and um, I I've had people <clears throat> describe, uh, somebody in an opening describe uh, some of these sculptures as poking fun and toxic masculinity with the phallus protruding from it. Um, and I really enjoyed that. It was a very direct and almost simple way of referring to a lot of the things that I engage with. Um, and so the humor is very important to me. Um, it plays a really significant role because um, I don't know if it comes off, but I also do a lot of you know literary research and theoretical research and stuff. And, you know, a lot of the times what I'm engaging with can be very heavy. Um, and it has, a, you know, there are very dark corners um, in a lot of the things that I'm really interested in. And so bringing in that humor is really kind of essential. Um, you know, and I do, I mean, I use a lot of formal tendencies that we might consider feminine color, right, color sweet color combinations. I use a lot of red, pink, and kind of very sensitive compositional tones, which many people have we've been maybe conditioned to understand those as feminine. Um, you know, 
link towards you know feminine attributes of myself, either psychologically or emotionally, as well as masculine, and those channeling into the work. Yeah, and I see uh, maybe an earlier generation feminist, um, Shapiro, Chicago, one taking a much more sincere um, approach to this. Like irony was not the tone that they were going for um, in that day. And so this younger generation, yourself included, and I think Katie as well, uh, there is um, uh, there's a playfulness there that you didn't see in the earlier generation, the reappropriation of femininity and, and um, the decorative. Would you say that's for Stout too? Yeah, I would say for sure. I mean, her work is, is super, super playful, um, and I think that she it's been characterized as naive pop, and she loves um, playing with uh, ideas of what you know, sexy and beautiful are. And I mean, there's literally a cord that's coming out of the vagina of that lamp. Like she's, and you, you turn it on by turning on one of the nipples. Like she's definitely poking fun at it, but at the same time, you know, it's a very serious piece. There's a tone that's very serious behind it, but I think it's accessible through the playfulness, and I think that's super important. That's something I also strive to do in my own work, to make it accessible. It's um, in silk, and that's a material that can be either worn or hung. It's meant for all different types of people as well, and I think that idea of accessibility, legibility, something that you can understand the story behind it, is, is also super important. So, anybody have a comment on the future of the style? Maybe for your own personal work, for... Um, the contemporary just, work I just look forward. Together. Yeah, I mean, half of our program, half of our contemporary program is female artists. And that has always been extremely important to us in building a program that will be interesting to our visitors and our clients. Um, it's, it's something that's on our minds every single day. Every single day. We cannot hang an exhibition unless it's a solo show. We cannot hang an exhibition or an installation that does not have a, a feminine point of view as well. It's just really important to us. And I think perhaps even more important to us because we are, I still get emails sometimes that say, dear gentlemen, to the gallery, dear gentlemen, because the name Herschel and Adler is so synonymous with an old male, you know, boys club from 65 years ago when it was started, dear gentlemen. But as a result, we've made sure that that's not the case and that we're paying close attention both in our uh, curatorial work as well as, as um, in making sure that our collectors' collections are diverse and interesting as well. Max, where are you going with your work? Well, I'm going a lot of places with my work. But I think for me that's a really interesting question because um, since we're within the scope of aesthetics of femininity, um, you know, what does the future for that look like? In, in many ways, I find it to be very similar to a more mainstream conversation of what does feminism look like. You're talking about Miriam Shapiro, how second wave feminists. Well, you know, they were all white women that were pretty much interested in the issues of white women. And so today we have a very different conversation, of course. And so I think that in decorative arts and in fine arts aesthetics, um, it's still, it's a very similar conversation. How can we understand a relationship to these constructs of feminine and masculine through a completely new understanding and a completely new lens that includes, you know, that represents everyone and kind of breaks down a lot of those traditional power structures and barriers that reinforcing feminine and masculine Continues, and so I think you know the the future is for this conversation is a very expansive and intersectional one. Gabrielle, I know you don't have a crystal ball, so you can't say what Katie's going to come up with next. But what about your own work, or maybe the direction of the gallery? I mean, I think it's it's really important on all different levels: on the gallery, on the artist, on the collector, on the museum institution. To continue to push this forward so that it's it's accepted and um, I think for so many years it's hasn't been accepted on the way that we see fine art and sculpture and I think that it's everyone's responsibility to continue to do that in the market. Great. 
So we have time to open up for Q&A, and I know that you want the microphone passed around, right, so you can get on tape. Do you want to take mine? Oh, okay, we've got a question in front of you. Hi, thank you so much. It was very interesting. And my question is for Max, and going back to the France and England's uh, colonialism of creating the museum, uh, idea, idea of museum. Um, you know, when in 2020, all those um, uh, people go and occur um, uh, the uh, only gendered or colored women, or whatever, all ethnicity works. You said that it's going to commodify, it's going to cause a lot of problems. Um, how can we prevent those if we know that it's going to be a problem? What would be the blocks to take, uh, uh, you know, initially? What would be the, you know, like preventive blocks for those happening to take uh, from the beginning so we don't have to get even more drastic, dramatic and situations? Thank you. Well, thanks for your question. I should clarify as well. Um, I, I don't necessarily mean to make an overarching statement that these decisions are inherently problematic. However, I do th think that there are some considerations um, because we find an array of curatorial styles, um, especially when it comes to acquisitions. Um, and there's a lot of art in the contemporary market that is focused on identity politics. A lot of artists working specifically in those conversations. So, a perspective that I hold that I think may be important in these considerations is to, when acquiring new works of a marginalized community with the intent of a, to, you know, balancing the scales, is to consider whether or not the artist and the work are being essentialized in the collection, um, whether or not they're being Know, are they being presented in a way that kind of essentializes that demographic in a period of time where the work is only about perhaps their race or their gender and maybe not about the kind of rigor behind the conversations the work is engaging. But that's one that comes to mind. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. My question's quick. So just quickly on the topic of gender equality, it was good to see that Goldman Sachs and they going forward, IPOs, uh, they would only work with companies doing IPOs if they have women on the board. So it's happening in different industries. My question really is about the um, sewing table. It was beautiful. And while I was looking at it, I thought to myself, so is that upper class women versus working class women? Was that a hobby? versus actually work to maintain? That's an excellent question. Um, work tables, sewing tables were made at all levels of production. They are made very, very simple and humble, and they are made very, very uh, rich and handsome, as the table I showed you. I tried to use an example that's being shown here at the fair so that a light bulb will go off for you when you see it as you walk around. Um, but no, they were made at all levels of production. It was an a tool to assist a woman in the home, which was her office, to get done what she needed to get done. It also served her well in play. Um, games, card games, whist, uh, games with pieces, um, writing letters to loved ones. It traveled around the house with a woman as she, you know, navigated her day. Did she have other friends in? Did they sit by the fire because it was cold outside? Did they sit on the porch because it was hot inside? Um, I think it was it was not just for women who were leisure class. Hi, um, as a dealer, only works with women artists and more recently has been working more with Native American women artists. I'd love to hear the panel talk a little more about what Mark brought up or, um, earlier and then also what I think um, was touched on in, at least in your exhibition that you spoke about, this idea how different, I think different communities, like think more contemporary art, different communities have, have 
have different access to being even considered feminine, and also then thinking historically, and like when you talk about traditional femininity, um, how certain groups of women maybe even couldn't be considered feminine in the same way, and how we think you know, different communities working with beadwork in different ways, or weaving in different ways. I know that's very broad, it's more of just like a prompt, if anyone would like to dig into that a little bit more. Thanks. Well, I, I think I can say that if you look at colonial portraiture, um, early American portraiture was pretty harsh at times. You look at images of women, portraits that were commissioned, photography didn't exist. Um, some artists, I'm sure, took artistic license and were kind, but um, we often come across portraits where a 26-year-old woman looks like she's 46, 56, and not made more beautiful by the artist. Um, I think time, time has changed um, the way we look at women and the way we perceive what is feminine. A lot of these portraits of women, people will come into my office and say, she looks like a man. Why didn't the artist fix that? Well, there's nothing, to, why should it be fixed? If that's how she looked, why should it be fixed? But it's a very strange thing to say. Um, again, artists may have made changes, artistic license, but I think then they were, they were the photographers, they were telling it like it was. And the notion of even thinking of have to fix it if she's not attractive is, is sort of shocking to me. I don't know, it doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's something that came to mind when you were prompting us. So in relation to um, the exhibition service stuff, is there a particular point where you see that being carried out? Or are you talking about like the general relationship of indigenous women to craft? More just the, that exhibition, I think, um, showed different kinds of um, being feminine mm -hmm. and how that there may not be traditionally or in the contemporary world one way to look at that. So I think different artists that included might not have been um, expected Right, right. So I was thinking about it slightly differently related to the first question, like how how can you, is there a way to get a, a, a avoid like identity politics as the, something that pegs and essentializes an artist of color, right? Um, which can easily happen. So in that exhibition, um, we'll just use one example, um, Jeffrey Gibson's work. Instead of focusing on his identity as a native artist, you look at his use of craft as it connects to a historic movement, in this case, pattern integration, which he's very, very interested in. He told me, I was surprised. He's like, oh, this is the first time anybody's talked about anything in my work besides the fact that I'm a Native artist. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I hadn't thought about that, but you, I see you as part of this much broader conversation. Um, and I suppose there's other ways that that happens in that exhibition as well. If you can branch out, look at things a little bit more um, like globally almost with terms like the decorative or craft and it's a different uh, manifestations and projections onto actual bodies. Other questions? Oh, right here. I'm not, I'm curious if you all have been to the Jewish Museum and seen the Edith Halbert show and, or exhibit and why I'm I was like, flabbergasted, not just by her, of course, acute, you know, in interest and passion for art and collecting, but that the whole place was basically all men's artwork, and in the photograph of her at the show is all men. Of course, there is George O'Keefe, well, but there's one woman. So, speaking of that, to that whole point is also the women of MoMA, how they collected mostly men, even though we could help her, ask, um, had a, Abby Alder Trockefeller help her with her collection, of course. Um, just, it stunned me that a woman didn't help women back then, even though she was an awesome individual, and not to be negative, but just like your opinions on that, about women supporting women, even back that far, when she was doing great work. Thank you. Well, I can say a little bit of some, something related to that, just the founder of, of MAD, Aileen Osborne Webb, of course she's looking at a different type of production, right? Like it's work that's already excluded from the mainstream art world, so there's a, a much more diverse group of people who are making it that come into the museum. Um, so she doesn't end up internalizing the same 
hierarchies and boundaries that some of the other women like that you're thinking about do, like within the art world. Because things like craft or decoration or the decorative, it's almost like an assumed wisdom, right? Like, of course it's not art. Um, so I think there's that, that problem. It takes a very long time for that to unravel. It's still in process. Um, so it doesn't surprise me uh, because their, their desire to be part of the center of the art world. So they necessarily also buy into a lot of those hierarchies and divisions that separate things like art and craft design. Anybody else want to agree with you completely? I think they wanted to belong. I really think they wanted to belong. And whether that's right or not, yeah. you know. I think it's almost, it's even more deep-seated than that. I don't think it's a question that could even arise, right? Like the, the horizon of possibilities was much, much more narrow when you thought about what could count as art. Especially with so much capital involved in the estates to collect, the kinds of social circles that you're surrounded by that are reinforcing those things. It's, you find it all, just in a lot of spaces in our society where you know structures that don't serve the individual person are absorbed by that person, and then they kind of push it back out. It, it's kind of part of the you know, it's part of the way that power operates a lot of the time. And so I think, especially when given influence, it's very easy to. I think she had a lot of obstacles during the time of being a female gallerist and dealer. Um, but regardless, I mean, you know, we need to integrate more women into programming now, and it's our responsibility to do it now. Any other questions? 